Hey everyone and welcome to The Year Was, the podcast all about today that gives you just enough information to effectively be that guy at the party, causing all your friends to question, hey, who invited you? Like, seriously, why are you here? I'm your host, Michael Montalvo, and for the next few minutes, we will swim through the river of time as we try and find out what makes today truly unique. In this episode, we examine the events that occurred August 25th. Ever since mankind first looked up at the night sky and saw that big blue ball of light that is the moon, we have wondered what its deal was. And are the moon people angry at us for coveting their cheese? One of the constants of the world has been the question, are we alone? Are there people on distant lands or in our metaphorical backyard that is the moon? And people want to believe it, from Wallace and Gromit to George Melies to Jules Verne to allegedly Joseph Smith and to the topic of today's episode. So let's explore the concept of moon people. The year was 1835, and on this day, August 25th, a series of articles written by Dr. Andrew Grant spoke of finding evidence of life on the moon in what has now become known as the Great Moon Hoax. Dr. Andrew Grant was an associate of Sir John Herschel, whom you may recognize as the son of podcast favorite, William Herschel, and is credited as the writer of a series of articles that the New York Sun began publishing in August 1835. In the articles, Grant spoke about how Herschel the Younger had traveled to South Africa and set up a powerful new observatory and observed all sorts of fantastical life on the moon. Life such as unicorns, two-legged beavers, and winged humanoids like the Mothman or Batman. You think that's a joke, but actually one of the creatures found and described was a superior species of Vespertilio Homo, which is Batman. So, kind of funny. He also spoke of the moon's geography, its craters, enormous amethyst crystals similar to that of planet Krypton. I added that bit to complement the Batman of it. And of course, rushing rivers and lush vegetation. The telescope that allowed Herschel to view these wonders was something to behold all in itself. The lens on its own weighed a massive 14,826 pounds, or roughly 571 medium to large Tasmanian devils. The articles instantly captured the imagination of the people who read it, and the New York Sun saw a massive increase in sales. The only problem was that it was all fake. But you already knew that, because I started all of this off by saying how it was a hoax. But here's the thing. It was all fake, including Dr. Grant. Alan. Jurassic Park. The Herschels were real, and the sun was a real paper, and it did see a boost in sales, but the whole thing was meant as satire, its purpose to poke fun at one Reverend Thomas Dick. Dick was an amateur astronomer, a reverend, obviously, and what we would now call a science fiction writer. He wrote textbooks that were used in school, all about Christian philosophy and science. He developed the ideas that the moon had an atmosphere, volcanic activity, plant life, and life life. He argued that the moon was Earth-like and was capable of all of these wonders. And while that sounds far-fetched today in our modern society of flat earthers, it was a different time then. Now, other astronomers observed the moon and came to the conclusion that there was no evidence to support these theories. No clouds or water, so no atmosphere, and no signs of volcanoes, but that still did little to discourage the believers of the idea. Johann Hieronymus Schotter, who made the most extensive map of the moon for the time in 1791, claimed that the moon had atmosphere but no rain. Franz von Paula Gertheson found what he claimed to be roads, and Wilhelm Olber believed rational beings could be found on the moon. I mean, even William Herschel believed that there was life on the sun, of all places. It was the beliefs of these men, however, that was the basis for the satire that was most likely written by Richard Adams Locke. 
For his articles published by the Sun, Locke adopted a new writing style based off of that of the Reverend Thomas, and included just enough facts to be believable. According to History.com, the Sun didn't admit to the ruse until September 16, 1835, but the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives also claim that Locke did not reveal the hoax until many years later. In an interesting bit of side trivia for you, previous episode subject and massively popular writer Edgar Allan Poe wrote a story that was similar, titled Hans Fall, A Tale, and had it published in June of 1835. This story told of a man who had returned home to Holland after having had lived and had adventures on the moon. However, due to poor circulation of the magazine due to its recent creation, few saw or even read it. It's unclear if this was an inspiration to the Great Moon Hoax, but we can guess that Poe was inspired or perhaps seeking revenge, as one of his next stories was titled The Great Balloon Hoax, based on this event and published by Locke. This story also potentially inspired Jules Verne in his story Around the World in 80 Days. The hoax, while outed as a fabrication, still had many believers and inspired others to tell tales of their own. Verne would write more stories, Journey Through the Impossible and From Earth to the Moon, and George Méliès would make one of the first science fiction films, Le Voyage de la Lune, which all explore similar ideas. These stories, and countless more, continue to inspire others. So if you find yourself looking up at the night sky, you just might see the man on the moon yourself. I don't know if that's an Andy Kaufman REM joke or not. I mean, who knows? The moon might be hollow. Or a space station. That's going to do it for us today. If you like this podcast and want to hear more, give us a rate and a review. That helps me out and helps steer this in a direction that is hopefully good for all. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can find the Year Was audio version on your podcast app of choice. You can find me on social media and at YouTube at the Apple Cider Club and... As always, I want to thank the Tim Kreitz Band for our musical theme, and thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.